Hey, welcome to Project Recovery, a podcast about addiction. More importantly, it's about recovery. And it's brought to you by our friends at Reprieve Recovery up there in Morgan, Utah. Uh, A wonderful facility doing wonderful things. Uh, Still uh, in their first year. Uh, but we've already heard from graduates that are doing wonderful things. Sure. And I've reached out to some of them and they said, you know what, I want to get a little more time under my belt. I want to get things going. And I, when I talk to people about being on the podcast, Dr. Matt, I always say, do it at your own pace. I don't ever want to force anybody. I don't want to beg anybody. When it makes sense to you, it'll make sense. And then the podcast is here for you. Because there's a lot of people trying to figure out what they want to do or if they're doing the podcast for the right reason. Uh, or the wrong reason. True. Yeah. Thanks. We've had people that have done the podcast just as a like a a source of pride or or, or a, a button to to push to say, hey, look, this is what I've done. Yeah. And that's okay because I still find uh, information and I- inspiration. Well, sometimes you need to push yourself, and maybe telling your story is a way to push yourself. I don't know. It depends on the person. So you know, and it's like our guest today. We're going to bring her in just a little early. This is Savannah. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. And we are riding up in the elevator today. Yeah. And I said, are you nervous? And you told me. Yes. And you said, which is (laughs) weird because. I never am. And so why do you think you're nervous to do the podcast? I don't know, but I have to remember it's not for me. You know, it's for the people listening that I can give hope to. I think that's that's a great answer. It's a yeah. great answer. But there is got to be something for you in it, don't you think? Like, I mean, right? Because, I mean, there's got to be, don't you think? Casey really wants there to be. Well, no, you don't have to make it if there's not. But, I mean, there's got to be a reason why you want to. Is it just, just to help others? I really don't know. And that's okay. Because I, that's, I mean. I will say this. As... A psychologist as a therapist talking things out helps us process things in different ways quite literally in different neurological channels in our brain so there is value in just talking things out and sometimes we don't know what that value is until afterwards so maybe that'll be something after the show savannah can think about you know in my 45 days of treatment uh and processing and working out my addiction there and, and i was 45 when i went in Uh, some of the things I said in the walls of Pinnacle Recovery were the first time that I ever uttered those things out aloud. Now, I had thought them to myself probably for 20 years, and that was the first time that I'd ever talked to somebody else aloud with it. And and, and it did. It made it more real, and it helped me process the information. So I know what you're saying, but and, and I think that's what's so beautiful about this podcast is that... I don't know if it'll happen to you today, but it's happened to many people who have sat in that exact same chair. They said, that's interesting. I've never thought of it that way. Mm-hmm. And they have probably told their story multiple times. How many times do you think you've shared your story? Maybe up to 10. And in and, and like 12 step meetings, process groups? Yeah, in jails, uh, institutions, rehabs and AA. And I've never done it for the general public. So maybe that's why it's a little more nervous because I'm from Utah and I, you know, there's a prominent religion here and my family got judged for drinking when I was young. Oh, I know. My house was known as the house of sin growing up in my neighborhood <laughs> Yeah, because my mom was a working mom. We, we did party a lot at my house and so yeah. it, was, it was a little bit due. Uh, but it, I mean, it was, I mean, I was the kid that wasn't allowed to go to a lot of the events. I wasn't invited over to a lot of people's yeah. houses for parties. Uh, there was one week every summer that they would go to EFY, especially for youth. Yeah. I was just kind of stranded by myself and wondering where all my friends went. And so there, there, there was a little <laughs> bit of that culture, and, and I get it. Yeah. So we're going to hear your story, and we're going to hear it in just a second. But before we get to that, Dr. Matt, I think this would be a good time to check in on uh, the wedding bliss that you're currently celebrating. Okay. So everything going good? It's wonderful. It's a little weird, though. Why? Well, it's wonderful because I truly am. Uh, I never wanted to get remarried. I, I really, I know some guys get divorced and they're just right on the dating apps and they want to get remarried. And I don't get lonely. I have plenty of interesting friends and things to do. I love my career. I love my kids. So it was only because I met this really awesome person and we're just a great fit for each other and my life's so much better with her. But the weird thing is we still have different houses. Mm-hmm. And I haven't, so I'm going to sell my house. 
just so people know that uh, she lives in uh, a different city than you. Yeah. And you both have children in high school. No, I don't anymore. Oh, so my, she... my youngest graduated okay. and her oldest graduated. She has two. So she has one kid in high school. And where she lives is about 25 minutes from where I live. So it's not terrible. Uh, but all her friends and close family members and things live in that area. And where I live, people know I live in Bountiful. I've said that a million times. In Bountiful, I love Bountiful, actually. And if it wasn't for her, I'd probably never leave. But I don't have have family there Mm -hmm. and most of my close friends live elsewhere so it kind of makes sense that now my kids are out of school and we'll sell my house uh, in the next you know coming year and uh, move in together so we we don't get to be together every night because during the week we're at our own houses so that's the weird part and you know um i don't love that but everything else is amazing all right. Well, I'm so proud and so happy for the both of you guys. Thanks. And you know what? You were there playing the music and having fun with us, and that was a big part of that day. Last weekend, we went up to Snowbird, and she had uh, family fly in, and we all had a great weekend together up there at Snowbird Oktoberfest and stuff. Um, but we were they all brought up how much fun the wedding was, and uh, and you were a big part of that. So well, thank you. I appreciate it. Hey, we've got a great show for you today. Uh, and normally we'd talk back and forth, but like in my life right now, you know, because this is the part where I share what's going on in my recovery. And I wasn't going to talk about it, but that's probably why I should talk about it. I found myself in it's this, a good therapy rule, by the way. I found myself in a situation uh, like a situation before in my addiction. And a big problem with me is I'm an eternal yes man. I never want to say no to anybody. Even that is it, true. Even if it's for a good reason. I don't want right. to be the guy that says no. And so I've been talking with my girlfriend and, and we're currently seeing a therapist and, and helping us better communicate. And uh, the therapist said something to me and my girlfriend that I thought was very interesting. The therapist said, when you say yes to everyone, you're saying no to your girlfriend and your children. Oh, interesting. Because that's what I've been doing. And because to be honest with you, six years ago, I thought nobody would ever ask me to host MC or, you know, do anything for their cause. I know you were legitimately worried about that. And so now I've been getting inundated and a lot of people requesting certain things and I never wanted to say no. So my weekends are really booked with events like that. And I would say knowing you, you like doing those things. So it's it's not like they're asking you to do stuff you don't like to do. You no. love to do it. And, 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 and it's decent money. Yeah. And it's a good time. And it's not digging ditches. And it's, you know what I mean? I really like to doing it. But what it's doing is it's taking me away from gotcha. my kids and yeah. my girlfriend. Okay. And so I'm trying to find that balance. And I'm trying to find my voice in saying no to people, mm-hmm. which is really, really tough for me. I mean, I, I, I don't want to say. You're a people pleaser. And I think almost in a pathological way like it has caused problems in your life and that's from one people pleaser to another i relate to you on that that's a hard thing to overcome and the problem is is that i overcommit a lot of times and under deliver and (laughs) And under deliver you think so now that you're sober you're not under delivering do you think on certain events i am because i can't give it my all all the time because i need time to recharge my battery i need time to have with my kids and my wife not my girlfriend so i'm not upsetting them you know what i mean so i'm just trying to spread myself way too thin and that way i'm coming up short in places that really matter yeah okay and so So that was a good thing to talk about in therapy and i don't know how to say no. I, I don't. And I think that's what made me such a good addict. Do you want a shot? Yes. <laughs> I never said no. Yeah. I mean, I, I just, it, it, it's it, it's not my nature. Yeah. I don't like to look in someone's face when I say no and see it. Yeah, a disappointment. disappointment yeah. I, I, that breaks my heart. Yep. And I, I would rather be the guy that sees their face light up. But I really can't maintain that and keep that going all the time because eventually... It, it, it comes crashing down. So are you going to try to make changes that way? Are you going to, how are you going to say no? So we, we've, we've started to implement new rules and say that I can only do three to maybe four events a month. Mm-hmm. Uh, me and my girlfriend are supposed to, and we don't do it every weekend, but 
get out our calendars on a Sunday mm-hmm. and find time to be with each other. Couples inventory time, Sunday afternoons, a good time to check your calendars together. And, and say, you know, but see, that's the thing is my girlfriend can tell you what she's doing next month on a Tuesday. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing tomorrow until I wake up in the morning. Yeah. And so, you know, I mean, it's trying to navigate that stuff. Are you willing to try to change that style? Of oh, yours? I've gotten way better since she's been around. I've got a calendar with stuff in it. Yeah, cool. <laughs> that's <laughs> you know? the first step. You know, and so I'm, I'm starting to get better. But then what I notice, I wasn't even really, what I notice is that I start to get really anxious because once again, I'm spinning all these plates in the air yeah, and trying to keep them going. And inevitably one's going to crash and that's going to break my heart and that's going to spin me out. Did your therapist talk about protected time? So a lot of times couples with really busy schedules will have to set protected time. And no matter what, we've decided this is our time to either do a family activity or just a couple's activity. Uh, People need protected time. Your protected time that you're really good at is the gym. Mm -hmm. You always do your gym time in the morning, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I'm not. That's vital to my recovery. That's vital to my daily existence. In the same way to relationships it's vital to have protected time and i think that's what we're going at we need to prioritize that because yeah. the thing that's so fun about the things that i get to do is that i can often bring my girlfriend and i can often bring my kids mm, but i can true. bring them to these cool events but they don't really get time with me because i'm worried about you're, emceeing the event well, you're keeping on, it on yeah. track and you're doing working. that so although they get to go to this they don't get quality time with me yeah like i've never thought that i would love high school football as much as i do now now. Yeah. I love it now more than when I played it in high school because I get to go see my daughter dance. I get to, yeah. I get to sit with my son. I get to sit with my girlfriend, you know, and, and that was good. And now I'm announcing the game so I don't get to <laughs> sit with them. And so it, it's a, I'm just trying to balance it all. And so I think that's that's really what's going on with me. And I've got to figure out a way to. So stress, is that ever make you think, oh, I wish I had something to make me feel a little looser? I know it's not alcohol. I, I know it's not, and I, and I don't. That's why I asked it that way. Yeah, because I know, I know you know you're and not, I, and I don't do weed. But, but you know how it is. People shift addictions. Yeah, and I don't do weed, and I don't do uh, any substance abuse. Uh, right, but I, I rely heavily on nicotine. Yeah, I know. I mean, it's. I mean, it's and distraction and distraction. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. Oh, <laughs> oh we got it coming at you, you from both sides. <laughs> but she's not wrong. She's not. So another thing I learned in therapy is sometimes I fill my day with so many things that I don't have to do the day to day. Does that make sense? Is that I yep. fill it with so much extracurricular stuff and anything there that I don't have to deal with what's going on at home. Well, you start at 5 a.m. and you go all day, I know. And so, wow, this has turned out to be a good therapy for me. Good therapy. Thanks, Savannah. You gave me some (laughs) stuff to talk about. There you go. We've got our guest today. Her name is Savannah Kemp, and uh, she's been sober now. Almost 16 months. That's that's huge. Congratulations. (laughs) Thanks, guys. Is that the longest amount of sobriety you've held? Yes. And what do you attribute this time to? What do I what? Attribute it. Like, I mean, um, probably the rooms of AA and uh, connecting with the higher power every day because every single time I put my hand or my life into my hands, I run it straight into the ground. But when I like let go and stop trying to control or manipulate or dictate how certain situations go, when I just let go and trust and like Do ask for right help, thing. ask for help from something. I don't even care what it is. It's something. My life becomes easier and I don't have to use and I don't end up on the streets. And you had a pretty hard life. We're going to find out more about that in just a few seconds. You're listening to Project Recovery right here on KSL. Hey, welcome back to Project Recovery. I am Casey Scott. That's Dr. Matt Woolley. He's a clinical psychologist. And our guest today is Savannah Kemp, who's celebrating... 14, almost 15 months of sobriety? Oh my almost 16. Gosh. Dang it. <laughs> numbers. There was a lot of numbers going on. Because close be, enough. Because before that, before your last relapse, you had how many months? 15. So I was, you know, the numbers You're are in You're in there. the ballpark. Let's, before we get to that, let's find out where the story of Savannah Kemp begins. Are you ready? <sighs> yeah. Okay. Gosh. 
Um, all right, where do you want me to start? So where'd you grow up? Uh, South Ogden, Utah. And... You got brothers, sisters? Yeah, I have an older sister, uh, Mackenzie, and she's 34. I'm 30, and my brother is 26. And growing up, we talked about it a little bit earlier in the podcast. You, did you feel like an outcast growing up in Utah? Yes, I did. Um, is I it definitely... because you were, weren't the predominant religion, or did you guys just live a different lifestyle? Why? Um, probably because I wasn't the predominant dominant religion um you know i always felt like i had to like the, i would have to bear my testimony and missionary lessons and if i wanted to have sleepovers with my friends i had to go to church with them on sunday so i'd be calling my dad like dad i don't want to go to church with these guys on sundays and he's like sav just come home <laughs> and i'm just like all right but i did get baptized when i was seven you know in my head i'm like I want to get dunked in a tub of water with a white dress on and see Jesus's face. That sounds amazing. Let's do this. So I did. <laughs> okay. But when you think about it and, and, and you're that young and that's what they're thinking of, why would you not want to? The drive is affiliation. You want to be with and like your friends when you're young. And if that's what they're all doing and there's nothing harmful obviously about it, then yeah, it makes sense. But when you talk about it, Dr. Matt, we've had people on the podcast where those years are so important because at that age, you just want to fit in. You don't want to stand out. Right. You want to fit in. And mm -hmm. that's a, a very easy way to fit in in the state of Utah. Sure. And so you got baptized. And how did that go for you? It was just like I was wearing a mask. I would say things that I didn't mean, that I didn't believe in, that I felt like I had to to fit in. And what does that do to somebody at that age, Matt? Well, you you said mask, so I mean, it's not a genuine reflection of who you are. So if that continues on during those formative years when you're building a sense of self, you know, those are the identity building years, um, you can start to develop a false sense of self or kind of a facade of who you are. And that can be confusing to a person who, if that continues on, you get to a point where you're like, do I really know the real me? Like, you know, this this yes. person that I've been putting out there, doesn't I don't feel connected to it. So it can actually be kind of a crisis of the self when you get to be a teenager or a young adult. And so how did that manifest uh, going into junior high and high school? It stuck through junior high a little bit, but I was a social butterfly. I was friends with every group, the potheads, the jocks, the nerds, like it didn't matter. Ferris you know? Bueller. <laughs> you know who Ferris Bueller yeah. is? Okay. I didn't know if that reference was, do you, Josh? Ferris Bueller was the kid that was in, he was like, he liked all of them. Let's invite Josh over for an 80s movie night. We'll, yeah. we'll watch the, the, the most important 80s movies. The Breakfast Club, Ferris Bueller. 16 Candles. Pretty in Pink. Yeah. St. Elmo's Fire. I don't know about that one. Okay. okay. So you, up until seventh grade, you were a social butterfly and yeah. you kind of wore the mask. Wore the mask. And so then around high school is when I took it off. And I was like, I'm done. Like, I'm good with these friends. They all talk shit behind their each other's backs. And, you know, so I kind of started attracting people that were like me, you know, families that were not religious and... Yeah, that's kind of who I became closer with until I graduated high school. Do you remember the first time you tried drugs or alcohol? Yes. Um, I was in high school and I was on the dance team. And so I signed, you know, over not to drink or use drugs. <laughs> and I partied, I think it, when I was like 15, I smoked weed and drank alcohol. And of course, naturally, the first time I drank, I drank a ton and blacked out my very first time and puked everywhere. And then I got called into the principal's office and they wanted to kick me off the dance team and whatever. And so I snuck it here and there from then. Um, and then my senior year, I didn't really party at all. And then- Why do you think you didn't party much your senior year? Because I found a good friend, um, a really good friend. And her name's Riley Hall. And I did cheer instead of dancing. Um, I was like, I wanna do something different. I'm done with this, you know, cause I won. I won all the solo competitions, like first place overall of 4A, 5A, 6A, didn't matter. Um, my sophomore and junior year, and I was an officer my junior year. And so senior year, I was like, I've been there, done that. Like, I want to do something different. Now, looking back uh, with all your accolades and all your awards and everything, it seems like you were doing pretty good in high school. Oh, yeah. 
Did you like high school? No. Why do you what? think that? Why do you think like that. that is? Well, Did you like high school? I loved high school. I would go back in a heartbeat. <laughs> I mean, I really would. I loved it with all my heart. That's I have to say, psycho. I had a great time that in high school psycho. too. But what I'm saying is, though, is that here's somebody who is checking all the boxes in high school, winning awards. Success because I felt like I had to. Like, the, okay, that was it. I didn't really I was, like. I like dancing. Yeah. You know, but did I like school? No. Girls were bitches. like the teachers weren't nice. Like it was just it was terrible. Honestly, how, I never will go back. How did you do in your classes, grades? Great, four point student. Wow. Yeah. So I'm getting I'm getting the sense that you're fitting the same mold that Casey fits, all in all the time. Yeah. A little bit. If you choose to do it, Too you're going to go all the way. Yeah. And so we don't have in, a regulator. No. no, no. There's no governor on that engine, right? It's and, easy for people and, like us to live yeah. in the black and white. Intense. It's hard to live in the gray. Yeah. And so if you're going to do dance, you're going to win first Everything. place if you're going to go to school you're going to get a 4.0 yes and then if you're going to party i'm going to become the best partier yeah so did that sort of happen in your senior year or no you no, said your senior college year? your college mm-hmm. well tell me about this good friend you you started to hint that riley your good friend she and, was a cheerleader and, and she so was the captain. why did that influence you not to party i don't know because she, she didn't, didn't and she, she didn't wasn't religious and so it was like oh like you don't have to Oh, so she was a little bit of a was, anomaly there. Yeah, and yeah. honestly, like I haven't even thought about this until sitting here right now. Okay, so that's interesting. That, that was interesting. You out. connected with her because she was like you in all those ways, yeah. but she didn't party, yeah. and so you kind of felt like, oh, I, I don't have to party either. Yeah, yeah. So you graduate uh, from Bonneville High School, mm-hmm. uh, and then you're off to college. Mm-hmm. Where do you go? The University of Utah. And uh, how did that go? So I did the dance team there. Oh, gosh. (laughs) (laughs) And I was taking 19 credit hours and in the honors program. It's just the same old different day, you know. That is a lot of school. Yeah. So it was a lot. And the dance team was terrible. So I only did it one year. Never wanted to do it again. So I didn't. And then I graduated. I mean, I got all my bad behaviors there, you know, because I was friends with everyone. So every night there was a different party. Yeah. You know, and the friends that were partying on Tuesday night weren't partying on Wednesday night. But this girl was because I was at a different friend's house. And then I was like, I'm drinking wine and doing homework. And it was like, oh, I'm good at this. Like, I'm good at doing school and partying and I can do both. Multitasking. Yeah. (laughs) And And it's fun. And uh, you had multiple groups in high school. You said it seems just like high school, but a little different. Yeah. Um, and you said you picked up all your bad habits there. No. No. That's just the, the tip. The tip of the iceberg. <laughs> so do you end up graduating? Yeah, I graduated. But I did fell out of my two classes in when I was 20. Um, so I had to re- wait a year and take those again to get my degree. So I walked, my family came and saw me walk and I had failed two classes. So I didn't actually graduate and I knew it. And I'm like walking with this, like, did your family know certificate that's fake? No, (laughs) (laughs) they know now. now. I know. I called my uncle. I was like, I didn't actually graduate and I'm really scared to tell my dad right now. So whatever I did it the next year and graduated and we're good. Yeah. And so uh, you graduate, what'd you get your degree in? health science. I learned about all the drugs, addiction and everything. And ironically, I still became an addict. So yep. it, knowledge Isn't that doesn't great? necessarily protect you. Does no. It? Yeah. And addiction Experience. doesn't necessarily. Why do you think you're interested in that though? That's like, you could have chosen anything. Well, I don't know because I felt like I had to choose something and that would be long lasting. Like that would benefit my, my life for the rest of my life. You know, yeah, I didn't know true. what I wanted to do. I was 18. Actually, I was 17. Because my birthday's in July, so I moved to college when I was 17. Okay. Yeah. That, that keeps fitting the mold of just being intense and ahead of the game. Yes. And, intense, yeah. extreme. Yeah. Yep. So you graduate, <laughs> and then where does your life take a turn? I was like, well, I think I want to get some sales experience. So I'm going to move up to North Dakota. <laughs> <laughs> the sales capital of the United States. Yeah. The sales capital. And knock door to door and make myself really miserable and get some hard sales experience like, uh, for Vivint. For Vivint, okay, yep. yeah, yeah. 
and that's where that's where things took a turn. So, so for those who don't know, in Utah, a big part of the culture is it's called a knock ink or door to door sales. And so what they it's a do, lot of companies based here, yeah, in Utah. So they'll go to North Dakota, they'll go to North Carolina, they'll go to Florida, all over, and they drop kids off. And then they bug spray, bug spray and solar, Solar. they go door to door and they make some really good money. Like, well, they can. Yeah. But I mean, there's, then that's the promise that they tell you. There's a lot of guys that will come home and say, I made 50 grand this summer. Yeah. Oh yeah. Or more. And that's like the least. Yeah. Usually. Yeah. If you're Dece. But I also have worked a lot with kids who have gone out and done those jobs. And I've known a few that have made big bucks, six figures in a summer. But also kids who made almost nothing. But the thing that's common for all of them is partying. Lots yeah. and lots of partying. Well, I can tell you from experience, my older brothers had to fly home his son twice because he wasn't making any money. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? And yeah. he'd be going, hey, Dad, they're not paying me. Yeah. And I don't want to do this no more. Uh, yep. Fly me home. I've known kids who, same thing. So how did the door-to-door uh, go? It was hard, you know. Um but it was good. And I found I was a good salesman, you know, but then I felt kind of manipulative because I was making people who I knew couldn't afford any of this shit. Buy. Buy it. And, but I didn't care. I didn't care. I was like, I've never seen a dollar bill in my life. I worked at Papa Murphy's in high school, you know, cause my friends did and whatever. So it was like, I haven't really made any money and this is what sales is. This is what I got taught to do, you know? And so, Yeah. But do, you, do you remember how much you made that first summer? I don't really because they pay you some in front. They pay you some in back. And I kind of was high on Roxy's and like heroin. So oh, oh, okay. I don't remember. That might be hard to remember. Yeah, yeah, it was a little hard. That how, makes the spreadsheet hard to you, read. Yeah, yeah, it does. How did now you weren't doing that in college, no. were you? Roxy's, okay. So how did you get introduced to it on the road? So, I, you know, I had messed with, like, cocaine and Molly and stuff like that up at Park City Live. I did a lot of partying in Park City. Uh, but I had never done the hard stuff. Like, I told myself, I will never do that. Like, I will never do that. That's what, I told myself that. That was your line. You know? That was my line. Mm-hmm. And so I started liking this guy, and he was kind of a bad boy up there. And we started, you know, becoming closer or whatever. And one time I was in his room, and he pulled out a piece of tinfoil— and he smoked a Roxy off a tinfoil. Mm. And my heart just dropped. Like, I was like, whoa. You know, like, that's, this feels bad. For those who don't know, because a lot of people listening to the podcast are loved ones of addicts, smoking a Roxy off of tinfoil, what does that mean? A Roxy is an opiate. So, but it's made in a lab. It's not like black tar heroin, but they're, it's the strongest. So a Percocet and a Laura tab have either like Tylenol or ibuprofen mixed in with it, but Roxy is just pure opiate. And so they, they, they crush it up mm-hmm. and then they put it on the tinfoil and then light it? Light a fire under the tinfoil with a straw and you smoke up the smoke. Yeah. And so when he did that, you said your jaw dropped. Why? Because- My heart. Oh, really? Well, My you said dropped. you felt bad to you. Yeah, like I was like, oh, this is not good. But I'm a yes woman and I'm a daredevil and I'm like, let's do anything. I'll climb the tallest tree. I'll jump off the tallest cliff. Like, yeah, let's go. Because yes seems a lot easier than saying no. Well, I just was young and complacent, impulsive and stupid. And so you did it the first time right there? Yeah. I was like, yeah, I'll try it. Why not? And I just learned about what they do to the brain, what <laughs> yeah. happens. You had a degree and it's like in that. Yeah. A degree. Yeah. I had a degree. <laughs> and and so what was it like for you, though, the first time? Um, It was like, it felt really, I mean, it felt amazing. It was like, I mean, I have major ADHD. And so, you know, I got in trouble as a kid a lot for it. And so it was almost like the first time that I felt grounded. Like I was like. My feet were planted and my head was like on my body and like, yeah, I felt it was honestly, it was crazy. Well, that's what opiates do, right? Like that you hit those opiate receptors. It's a, it's a painkiller. It's analgesic. It's, it slows you down. It calms you down. Which I've never experienced that. Yeah. My life has always been a Tasmanian devil mess. And I think people with 
ADHD yeah. and people with high anxiety, the first time they drink something or smoke something that changes that experience, they've, ne- they've never felt that way before. Mm-hmm. Is this the first time you've ever had a life-changing effect from doing a substance? Like where you went, whoa, this is different. Yeah, because alcohol, I just drank so fast that I didn't enjoy any part in it. I just drank until I was blacked out, you know? And I thought that was normal. Like, I thought that was normal, blacking out. That That, was the game. Everyone was like, what happened last night? So I thought I was normal. I wasn't, you know? I was always the one to drink more, out drink everybody, and I'm this 120 pound girl, Mm -hmm. you know? And I could out drink my six foot five football friends, you know, so. And they probably, were, you know, in college days, they were probably giving you a lot of positive feedback for that. Like, whoa, she's Absolutely. so cool. And Absolutely. wow, you know, you got a party with this girl. Yes. And, you know, and so all of that positive social reinforcement is that's as, as intoxicating as the alcohol. I yeah, think. totally. All right. Back to smoking uh, Roxy in North Dakota. <laughs> <laughs> what did I, is that not right? That's like, sounds right sounds, to me. That's right. <laughs> yeah. So after that first time, when was the second time you did it? Do you remember? Like, uh, I didn't stop. Just continued knocking door to door and smoking Roxy's, getting sales, getting money. Did you feel like you were addicted after the first one or didn't even think about it? No, I don't think so. And I don't even think about things. I never thought about anything. Well, future planning is really hard for people with ADHD. Like, you know, you're kind of scattered and, you know, being kind of linear and logical and thinking about the future is difficult for those folks. And so you were probably like, hey, I'm just in the moment and I'm making moment. lots of sales and this is what we're doing right now. And, and, and spontaneous. You, yeah. The, and the things work out. Yeah. And I had trust in that. And the, Shit falls the, the problem is if you're intelligent and motivated, like you can kind of make things happen for you. So it, it's hard to make the argument, I would assume at that point in your life, that there was anything going wrong. Yeah, no, everything was great. Because that's the lie of drugs and alcohol is it works until it doesn't. Yeah. And, and in the beginning, it's like, this is amazing. I'm still getting everything done and I'm having fun. Why can this be bad? Yeah. Yeah. And so how long did you... Stay with the smoke and Roxy. Did, did, did that ever? We moved back to Salt Lake and um, I had an apartment in the avenues. And I remember I had some trips and stuff like that planned with my mom to go to Arizona or something. I don't remember exactly. There's so much, you know. So, But I did know that we, we ran out of Roxy's. And so this guy, Chris, he went and found some heroin on the street and brought it into my apartment And I remember saying, like, get that the fuck out of my house. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, the stereotypical heroin. Like, Like, I didn't know the difference. Yeah. Like, I didn't know that heroin was less bad than Roxy Mm -hmm. or like, you know what I mean? Like, I didn't know. It just seemed dirtier. It it just was heroin. Like, everyone talks about, you know. But it is less potent than what you'd been doing. Well, nowadays it's not. Nowadays it may not be. Because of the fentanyl. Yeah. But yeah, so, and then, but I started feeling the withdrawals and I became desperate. Dope sick. And so I was like, all right, like. And those, it was it, the Roxy's get expensive and that's another reason. Well, his dad Access, was giving them to him for free. Oh, okay. Which but is did that disgusting. run out? Yes. Eventually, yeah. Eventually. Once it runs out, After then like six you months, get desperate. He didn't get the prescription anymore. And so, yeah, we had to smoke heroin. And in my head, I'm like, all right, well, I'm already smoking heroin and this isn't even that bad. Like I can like get up, I can walk around, I can do shit. Alcohol cripples me, you know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so I'm like, hmm, all right, well, I've already done the worst. Might as well try crack and meth too. That oh. was the logic in my head. <laughs> Might as well go all in like everything else in life, huh? Yeah. yeah. So how does that look? So that looks like he went and got it and we just were smoking meth crack and heroin driving down to vegas and gambling coming back and forth and living like rock stars for a while and then um i started to what well i was gonna say during any of this time did you ever have any run in with the laws did your parents did his parents did anybody nobody stepped in and said my parents had no idea And, and and you'd been running and gunning for how long it was probably like six months maybe a year i don't know 
And no idea. No idea. Driving back and forth from Vegas. Yep. Living like rock stars. Yep. And then what happened? Well, oh my gosh. So I used to, so then, you know, I started to have like the negative side effects of meth and crack uh, where I started to pick at myself. Um, so I have pictures. I used to pick from head to toe craters in my face, in my arms, in my chest, mm. everywhere where I looked like a scary meth head, which I was. And I was like 80 pounds. Oh boy. And so, cause I don't know about that. What, what in the meth causes you to do that? Why, why do people pick at their face? I mean, I've seen it before on people, but yeah. I, what makes you do that? Is it just an obsession, something to do? Well, it's like, have you ever, you, have you ever taken Adderall? No. Okay. So Adderall, it's a stimulant, right? So it, you, you are more like able to do things like clean your house or study or whatever. It helps people hone in on something. Um, so when you have nothing to do because you're living at the downtown Motel 6, carpet surfing for crack pieces, you look in the mirror and you start just like picking at your face. And these meth mites or is what they call them. It like You can look in the hallucinations from meth. You look at your skin and it's like you have all these little like kind of zit things that are here. And so you just pick and pick and pick because you're hallucinating and you think things are still there. But then once you detox or come off of it, you're like, holy shit, like I didn't have any zits. Yeah. So it's, it's this hyper focus and it's a type of self stimulation where you're just repetitively doing this over and over and over again. And you're right that you're not in a logical frame of mind. So hallucinations are really common at that point. Yeah. yeah I should show you these pictures. So where does it go from, you know, the motel six and how do you end up at the motel? I lose all my money um, on drugs and stuff. Look at my face. And this is like four weeks after they were healing. Oh my goodness! Look at that, Doctor Brown. Yeah, it, it wow. was my whole body. That's just that doesn't my face. look like you at all. Yeah. Oh, you put it's the weekend at the bottom of this one. <laughs> I know that's a Snapchat. Do you know Richie Wilson? <laughs> yeah. Me and Richie, I sent that to him, and so we look at each other and we're like, "It's the weekend." <laughs> <laughs> We've had Richie Wilson on the podcast. Yeah, yeah, Richie's good. <laughs> <laughs> so you lose all your money and that's not why we're laughing and that's so mm. i couldn't afford my apartment anymore and my parents still have zero idea that their daughter is a homeless crackhead living <laughs> so, they, well did they how, how did you pass that off like uh, how did they not know so we ran out of money yeah. you know and we were at the motel six and um i thought i was pretty like i looked in the mirror and i was like oh look i'm like so skinny i look so pretty like a psychopath 80 Sick. pounds. That's crazy. Sick. Yeah. So I just remember I was, I'd had it. Like I'd had it up to here. I'm, I'm like, I am so done with this. Like I can't eat. I haven't eaten and I don't know how long, like I'm going to die. So, um, I just remember telling him like, I have to be done. Like, and he wasn't really ready to stop because I would catch him trying to take my debit card and go like withdraw money when I was trying to sleep or whatever, because when you're on heroin, you know, you can sleep, but when you're on meth and crack, you can't. So you have to like use them to get up and then to go to sleep and then to get up and then to go to sleep. So when I was asleep, he'd go try to steal from me. And that's when I was like, all right, like I'm done. Like get the f out of my car. Here's your shit. And I drove straight up to my parents' house and I went up into the room that I grew up in and I went through withdrawals. Oh, by yourself in there? By myself in there. Oh. Um, but... I think I snuck him in. I, don't, I forget when it happened, but I think I snuck that dude into my parents' house a couple times before I actually went through the detox or the uh, detox because or the withdrawals because I remember having him in my room and my dad walking in and catching us and him freaking out. Like my dad, he's like, if I had a gun that night, like I would have killed him. Like I would be in prison like right now today. And I remember they kind of got in a fight, uh, but then Chris disappeared and I went through withdrawals, cold turkey, and it took a solid month of me laying in bed, not being able to sleep, watch TV, eat, move, because you have zero energy. And uh, I got bed sores 
Mm-hmm. And my dad came home from work like six different times in a day to see if I was breathing because he'd never dealt with anything like this. How come you didn't go to an inpatient treatment? Because we didn't know about them. We didn't know anything about this yet. I wasn't a raging alcoholic before this. Like, was I a big partier? Yeah, I was. Did I have a DUI when I was 18? Yeah, I did. But I just thought I was unlucky, you know? And um, so, yeah, so right when I walked in the door, like from being gone for a long time all summer and everything and seeing like (laughs) the look on my parents' face, it just was like, they were like, they didn't know what to do. They didn't know what to do. They were probably scared, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so they take you upstairs into the room you grew up in. You detox. You spend a month in bed. Mm -hmm. Bed sores. Mm -hmm. um, And then what happens? You you feel like you're going to try to ease back into society or at that point what was your game plan um that's just the first run in with drugs like i have probably 10 more instances where i've had relapses and i cross addicted to other drugs because i didn't know how to stay sober i didn't know what the solution was um and so i just went from i mean i just remember finally being able to get out of my bed walking outside looking at the sun and thinking it was beautiful and just crying like because I could feel and I could just like I could just see beauty again when I hadn't for so long and so then at that point I was just like all right I'm just I'm not going to touch those hard drugs you know I can still drink alcohol Mm -hmm. and so then I started drinking a shit ton of alcohol Um, and then I got a second DUI and then alcohol stopped working for me like big time. Like the last time I drank alcohol, I was at the LDS hospital with 0.55 blood alcohol level. Wow. I seize. 0.05 is illegal driving. In Utah, yeah. And she's 0.5.5? Did that cause a seizure? So 0.55. Yeah. So you die at like 0.4? Yeah. Like they were like, I've never seen this. Yeah. And that was just a week of binge drinking, you know? Just a week of it. In when was that? March 2020, I think, is that when that was. This is the last time I've had a drink of alcohol. Oh, wow. Um, what got you to LDS Hospital? Like, why did you go in? I don't know. Oh, okay. You Someone, took yourself? No. Oh. There's no way. You know, I don't know how I got alcohol for that whole week, but I did somehow. Mm. It wasn't from driving because my parents will take my keys or whoever. Because my everyone's aware of like my struggles mm. and my family and my friends. They support me. And so if there is a relapse or anything like that, then, you know, they have a little system. They're like, all right, swipe the keys. So but somehow you got the alcohol to the point that you should have probably seized up and been in a coma, and maybe died. Yeah. Yeah. How many near death experiences do you think you've had? Well, there was one time when I was at the detox at LDS hospital, like seriously, I've been in the hospital so many times, it's psych wards, like three different times, but jail cells. And so when I was in LDS hospital, I was in detox and I manipulated my way to get out because I was miserable. And I snuck down into the pharmacy and I stole a bottle of rubbing alcohol and I drank the whole thing in the middle of winter. Wow. Drank the whole fucking thing. Died on the, the lawn. And uh, I have pictures of that too. And so the, cause I wasn't supposed to be let out. So they, my boyfriend at the time started videoing because he was livid that the hospital let me out. But the, this was a God moment is what I call it. So Josh's mom went to my apartment to see where I was because I was like, Josh, come get me. And she pulled out my iPad and she like opened it. And usually there's a password, right? But it just opened for her. Hmm. And then she clicked on find my iPhone and you know how you have to type in Apple ID and password. Yeah. It just opened for her hmm. and it showed her my location. It showed her my phone at 1% up in front of the LDS hospital. So Josh came, found me my body was gray, purple. Hmm. I was cold. It was freezing outside and the paramedics came and they resuscitated me. And I watched that whole thing because I re- you know, threw up and they put an NPA and an OPA up my nose and uh, in my throat. And I was put on life support for 10 days and in a coma. 
and Holy on cow. a ventilator, you know? Uh -huh. And then I just remember waking up and thinking, fuck, like, I'm still here. Were you, did you have an emotion about recognizing that you were still here? I was pissed. Tell me more about that. I am just sick and tired of being a burden on my family. Like, seriously. I couldn't figure it out. You know, I'd go to AA. I've been in nine rehabs, you know, for all different substances. You know, went from like kava to kratom to air duster to cough syrup to xanax to it's just like i went down the list of drugs because one stopped working mm -hmm. you know and i'd go to these aa meetings because i was forced into rehab a million times and i'd see these people pick up 60 day chips and 90 day chips and six month chips and i'd literally think to myself how are they doing this like i go to treatment and if I don't am AMA or get kicked out mm -hmm. of treatment, I can only stay sober for 30 days. And right when I walk out, it's not even a few days before I'm getting higher f up again. And how are they getting 90 days? Like, I just didn't understand. And when I don't understand something, like, that's when I'm really, really like, I like, I seek to understand. Makes I seek to understand. I want to be understood and I want to find solutions because solutions bring me happiness. And it makes you super aggro when you can't. Yes. Yep. You can see it in your body. You know, I mean, you can see that. Yeah. I mean, it, it's infuriating because I too was like you that I would sit in those rooms and I would look at those guys with 30, 60, 90 and I'd be like, one, how do they get there? And two, I can't imagine a life without having drugs or alcohol in it because that's not a life that I want to live in because it seems to be the only thing that brings me joy. And at this point, it's not even bringing me joy, but it's making me able to walk around and not kill somebody. Yeah. So what does your rock bottom look like? It says you went to nine different rehabs, in and out of different hospitals, multiple near death experiences. What is your last rock bottom? And what did that look like? <laughs> There's two I can think of. One of them was when I came to believe in a power greater than myself because I was an atheist, especially going through all that Mormon stuff. You know, I was like ignorant to, you know, there's something bigger than me that did all of this. And like, we're, we're floating in space on a marble. Like that's magic. And I can't explain what that is and how it became the way it did. And, um, I was doing air duster and this was only because I didn't have money to buy drugs. I didn't have a car because I've had two DUIs. My license was gone for two years. So I had to walk or ride a scooter to the store to be able to uh, steal cough syrup or air duster. That's the only reason I was using those. I don't like them, but I couldn't stop. So I was using probably like 25 cans of air duster a week. And oh my gosh. Wow. And, um, I had this feeling I was going to die and I was good with it. I was like, oh, I'm just like, I'm good with it. I'm good with this. And um, all of a sudden, like I felt something wrap their arm around my arm and then on this side of me too. And I like, I don't know if it was like my spirit or my soul, like looking or if it was my physical body looking side to side to see these two transparent beings that were like, glowing and they were male they had brown hair and it's like i felt like i knew them like i knew them but i didn't know how i did mm. and they lifted up on me and i felt my spirit like separate from my body and i got kind of high and then i just remember i thought about my family and i was like my family you know my family needs me and i pulled down as hard as i could and i was like no and i screamed and they just like went away and then I was just like out of it and someone found me and then my bladder was retaining water and so I had to get a catheter for 10 days and you know like in situations like that I had a boyfriend who 
Josh is still in my life today. He was a godsend for my family. He came in and he never gave up on me. He saw the potential in me. He saw what a good person I was. He didn't even understand or have like addiction in his family that he really was close to. He never gave up on me. And he was there for me, writing these small notes, giving me hope, telling me how proud he was of me, coming to visit me in rehab, being there for my family, spending the nights in hospitals, bailing me out of jail. Like he was literally the person who got me through this aside from my family. And in those situations, you had to, I, you know, I tend to turn to humor. And so I named my catheter Kathy Two Chains. <laughs> and I literally put it in a Lululemon bag to be able to go eat, you know? And it was like, I thought this could be permanent. Like I yeah. might have a catheter. Yeah. So that was a really big rock bottom because then my family had an intervention with me and they're like, okay, we're done. No resources, no nothing. You need to go to rehab or we're done. And they all wrote a letter to me. And so in that moment, I was like, all right, well, like I kind of had hope because I used to stress about death. I used to be like, it's just dark. What's the f-ing point? You know, and now I'm like, I just saw people that I knew that comforted me. Mm. This isn't it. Like I'm here for a reason and I'm, ch- I chose to live. Like I chose to live that day. So I'm going to live. And I went to rehab and I got my first seven months of sobriety. Yes. What did that feel like when you got that seven months? I couldn't believe it. I was the person that would sneak all the e-cigs into the rehab. I would sneak coffee because we weren't allowed coffee or sugar. I'd sneak candy. I'd sneak my iPad in. I was all this contraband. I was that person dealing to all my friends. You know, I was like the ringleader of like, you want this? All right, got you, you know? (laughs) And so then I remember I just had this like, it's a moment. I had a moment and I was like, I am doing the same old shit right now, you know, because the therapists and everyone, they went and searched our rooms and found all the shit and brought it in a garbage bag, pulled all of the clients downstairs and they were like, who shit is this? And I just got up and I like went and got all my shit and there was a couple other things, but it was the majority was mine. <laughs> and I was thinking in my head, I'm like, they didn't even get all of it. <laughs> I have like coffee up in the air vent hanging from, you know, string in a plastic bag so they wouldn't find it. And I have an e-cig here. Oh, yes, I'm chilling, you know. But then I was like, all right, I'm going to go get the rest of the shit and I'm going to turn it in. So I went and got everything and I turned it in. And that's when I broke the cycle of uh, addict behavior. Mm. And I was honest for the first time in my life. And also... And I don't know if this is true or not, but you took some accountability. Mm-hmm. And addicts, that's tough for us, yeah. is to have ownership and accountability. Yeah. So not only did you get busted and took the accountability for that, you went and found the stuff that they didn't find and yeah. turned that in. Mm-hmm. And so at that point, did uh, your recovery take a change? Yeah, that's when I you know, got this first seven months. And then I got sick and I thought, you know, after seven months I got sick and I was like, all right, like I can have Mucinex, which has dextromethorphan in it, which is a cough suppressant that gets you high. You know, it's the it's a pill, but cough syrup has alcohol in it. So I'm like, okay, I can just have the cough suppressant without the alcohol, cough syrup, like a normal person. And that wasn't the case. Um, I took one and then I took two the next day and then I took three and then I was on cough medicine again and then I was drinking cough syrup and so that was bad and then I quit and got I think like 15 months the next time and that's when I worked the steps with a sponsor of AA but I wasn't necessarily like going to meetings frequently it was just to pick up a coin you know um and then after I got that 15 months, I got sick again and I tried the Mucinex again to see if I could. I'm like, I already had 15 months. Like I can have cough medicine like a normal person. I'm dying from COVID right now. And that wasn't the case. And then that quickly spiraled, you know, from using that into gabapentin and then into Xanax and into Kava and Kratom. And then I went to Mexico to my best friend's wedding and I was high there on Xanax because you can get whatever you want in Mexico. 
And then I came home early because I was a mess. And my phone, I had broke in Mexico because that's what happens when you relapse. Things start to break around mm -hmm. you. Yeah. And so my phone, my phone was the first thing to go. Ruining a wedding was the second thing. Just kidding. It's no, the I wedding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so basically I got on a scooter because I knew I couldn't drive. Got on a scooter, drove to the Apple store. Um, this is last year. This is last year in April. Drove to the Apple store and fixed my phone. And then I was like, I'm already just like taking 20 Xanaxes a day, 20 Xanax bars. Like I'm already 20 yeah. Xanax bars a day. Mm -hmm. That's a lot. Yeah, that's a lot. Yeah. And I'm like, all right, I'm going to just pull some cash out. I'm going to go get loaded. I'm going to go down to the block, North Temple, and I'm going to get some Maybe some, I don't know about heroin. The withdrawal suck with that. I'm going to go get some crack. Maybe heroin. I don't know. And uh, I think in my head, you know, my higher power was like, you want opiates? All right, we'll give you opiates. So I crashed, broke my neck in two places. On your way my, to the on block. On my way to go get loaded. Yeah. Broke my collarbone in half, woke up in the hospital again after 15 months of sobriety and they told me, do not move a muscle for 24 hours. Like, you could be paralyzed. We might need to take you into surgery. We don't know yet. Don't move a finger, like Orito. So I'm laying there, and they put me on fentanyl. Oh. Didn't know I was an addict. Put me on fentanyl. My higher power's like, here, here you, you go. go. So um, Careful couldn't what you move ask for, huh? for 24 hours. I woke up, saw my dad's face, and that is the most heartbreaking, is to see my dad over and over and over with just heartbreak in his eyes you know it's like what i've put them through and like what they've done for me and not judged me and just supported me through all of it has like like i wouldn't be alive without him today you know and so seeing his face just dis just disappointing my family one more time you know when i thought maybe i had it um was heartbreaking so anyway i had to recover from that had to go to five detoxes to get off opiates again and i did it and now i'm here which that is an amazing story i mean to what you have battled and what you have gone through uh and to be standing here is a testament to recovery and the power of the human nature. I mean, it's, I mean, the resiliency of the body. And, and I mean, it's, it's a lot. What is it uh, that's gotten you through these 16 months? Like, what is it that you're doing now that maybe is different from times before? I wake up every single day and I... I make like conscious contact with something bigger than myself that I know is keeping me sober because it's not me. I am not doing this. You've had some strong spiritual experiences. Yes. Yeah. And um, I go to meetings. Um, I'm honest. I'm direct. I'm authentic. And um, service. I care about people. I do things for people because it helps them and it also helps me. And um, I have a sponsor. I go to Fit to Recover. I work out. I mm -hmm. eat healthy. Um, cold plunge sauna. Like, I do a lot of things that mm -hmm. are good for me. Like, I destroyed myself for a really long time. And now I wake up every day and I say thank you. And please help keep me sober today. I love it. Yeah. And I love the fact that you're doing multiple things. And it sounds like you're filling your life with behaviors of not just recovery, that's the term we use here, but it's of a healthy life, really, yeah. right? You know, you're in touch with your spiritual uh, connection, you're in touch with other people, you're ser giving service and giving back, and you're taking care of your body. And I think for somebody, I mean, that's a formula for life, whether you're an addict or not, but it's certainly the best way to get through and, and feel like you're living a life of recovery. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it, it was just like, in my addiction, it was just like, I kept constantly trying to do something. You know, like I went to entrepreneur school, I went to coding school, 
and I went and I tried to do this and I went and tried and I just failed over and over and over and over again. And so like, I just feel like this has given me so much. Like it's given me emotional regulation. It's given me like impulse control. It's given me this like authenticity and directness where it's like no room or time for bullshit or beating around bushes. Like I don't care anymore, you know? And it's given me um, I kind of just blanked. You know, it's crazy because you sat there <laughs> and you just went four things that you failed at. Mm-hmm. And those seem to be hanging heavy on your head. But all the other things you succeeded in, uh, college degree, dance trophies, this, that, and this, you, you, you didn't pay any mind to them. But the four things that you said you failed at. Well, that was before my addiction even hit the fan, those successes. But what f- it, it gave me success of failing like becoming good at failing like i'm good at failing so mm-hmm. i'm resilient you know uh-huh. failures are part of life i mean yeah. we learn more from our failures than our successes yeah all day long so it sounds like you've got a, a good grasp on what's going on um besides the 12 steps and a connection to your higher power what are some things that you find that really help you in your recovery uh, I, I know you said, uh, you know, service and that, but was there something that you found out about yourself that you wish you would have known 10 years ago? Like positive or negative? Or just anything about why you do what you do or did what you did. Does that make sense? No. Because like, <laughs> does that make sense to you? I, I'm not really sure what you're going for. Like, other than like some insight she's taken yeah, from that, that experience. From, because yeah. like when people get into addiction, you know, there's anxiety, there's trauma, and, and what it was was there something you found out about yourself that you're like, oh man, I wish I'd have known this ten years ago. The only thing I I don't know I really don't because I didn't even know myself. I'm still learning about myself and who I am. You know, I think when a person's in, you know, in that um, cycle of failure because of their addiction, they start to lose hope or even think about the future. Tell me what you mean. I started to lose trust in myself. Okay. Yeah. Like I, I didn't trust myself to hold a job, to go to school, to stay sober, to do anything. So, and the expectation of being Jeff Kemp's daughter, you know, his friends, his family, like you're gonna, they told me, you're gonna be the CEO of a major corporation or you're gonna be in prison, Savannah. There's no in between, you know? So that pressure Mm -hmm. always felt like, and I had a sister who went to PA school, has her own business now and a family, like she set a high bar. Mm -hmm. Um, So the pressure of that was almost just like a lot, but I knew my potential, like I knew I could do Mm -hmm. a lot but I didn't know how. Mm. And so when I proved them right and I ended up in jail and even worse, like on my deathbed, now it's like I wake up every day and my parents are proud of me and Mm. so is everyone else for staying sober today. Yeah, The bar is down here (laughs) and I'm like, oh my gosh. And now I go to AA and I listen to all of these people who are 50 years, 80 years old who have years of sobriety under their belt and I listen to wisdom for mm-hmm. free mm-hmm. all for being a like piece of shit, you know for a long time and I just feel blessed because the stuff I hear in that is how you get through life mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. the healthiest honest way you know I want everyone to go to AA and work the 12 steps and empty out all of their stuff. I've said to people before, whether you are an alcoholic or not, if you lived your life by the 12 steps, you'd be ro- rocking it. I yeah. mean, that's a great way to, it's a great formula for life. Absolutely. Fears, resentments, sex misconduct, mm. you know, and I didn't go into a lot of that about my addiction, but there's some of that too, obviously. Well, there usually is for people. How yeah. about, have you started to develop a hope for your future and things? Totally, that, you know, uh, so this year I was able to go to Mexico and by myself and conquer a fear of being alone mm-hmm. and learn a different language. So I did that this year and um, I'm in real estate school now. 
Great. And I can take the exam in a couple of weeks. Oh, good for you. And yeah, so there is. I have trust in myself, you know. Dr. Matt, what do you think about Savannah's story? <laughs> well, I mostly I just really appreciate that you're willing to come on and share your story because that's so valuable to other people. Uh, you've had experiences that a lot of people will never have and some experiences that people have had and uh, people can relate and learn from you. So thank you for coming on. One of the phrases that has stuck in my head as you started talking about the recovery part of your story is the term uh, radical honesty. And sometimes in therapy, we talk about that, not just in recovery, but in any kind of therapy, that until a person can be radically honest, and radical honesty isn't just telling other people the truth, it starts with telling yourself the truth. You know, can I be radically honest with myself about myself and about who I am? And you mentioned, I didn't know who I was. Well, that's because you probably weren't able to be honest with yourself. And radical honesty sounds like it was one of the pieces that helped you turn the corner and want to be a sober person and, and believe you could be a sober person. So that's my takeaway uh, amongst many others. But that idea of radical honesty also fits an intense personality and intense personalities do big things. And that's awesome. The thing I think about your story is the resilience, resilience of the human body, the human spirit, because you embody both of those. I mean, from multiple near death experiences to a multiple hospital stays to multiple uh, inpatient treatment centers, you know, uh, that you're here. And, and she's only 30. And, and, <laughs> and, and, and rocking and doing amazing things. And not only that, you know, at one point, you know, you show those pictures and hopefully we can show those to Josh and we can put them on the Facebook to see where you are and where you've come. Uh, and you attribute a lot of that to a higher power to find that 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 hope, that inspiration, that lifting. That That's amazing. And, and I want people to know that recovery is possible because your story is one for the books. I mean, it's it's an amazing story. And I think you're just getting started. And I think you can still be the CEO of a major company and a real estate, uh, you know, guru, all of these things, because you are the type of person that if they see they want something, they'll go get it. And, I, and I'm impressed by you. I think this is going to be an amazing journey. And I can't wait to keep in touch with you. Thank you. It's, it's amazing. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you guys for having How's me. How's your neck? Ah, uh, my collarbone is like shorter. So this, so it's been really an adjustment because I work out yeah. and stuff, you yeah. know? So it's been, it drives I was going to say, you're going, going to FTR, you're and working out. And my neck's out. good. Yeah. You okay. know, sometimes I hear, I feel yeah. it, whatever. Yeah. Uh, but I go to a chiropractor. Yeah. Well, good, good. I, I was just it. curious. <laughs> uh, and we also got uh, Savannah from Charlie Osborne, who was a guest two weeks ago. Up Charlie's at a good man. Yep, yep. He's a pretty cool dude. I love that man. He's uh, he's doing wonderful things in the recovery community, and so is Action Recovery. Go check him out. Thank you for stopping by and listening to another episode of Project Recovery. And in case you forgot, Dr. Matt, Project Recovery is what? It's a KSL podcast. How's her neck? <laughs> what kind of question is that? I was worried. Weird. Oh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs>